Bhagavatam Patraji Ki Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Janma Yasya Yato Divyat Itaratas Charte Suavikya Swarat Janma Yasya Yatam Vajari Taratas Charte Suavikya Swarat Tene Brahma Hirdaya Adikavaye Muyanti Atsurayaha Tejo Varimadam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisago Mesha Tejo Vanimidam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisago Mesha Damna Sada Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi Damna Sveena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all-pervading personality of Godhead. O all-pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because He is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because He is the absolute truth. And the primal cause of all causes. And the primal cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, destruction, the manifested He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and directly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause behind him. And he is independent because there is no other cause behind him. Is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? Is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? The original living being. The original by him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations, as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water, of water seen on fire or land seen on water, only because of him do the material universes, only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by reaction to the three modes of nature, temporarily manifested by the reaction to the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is, eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representations. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitra Vutra. Dharma Pujita Kaita Vutra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shivadam Tapo Trayonanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamunyu Kite Shimad Bhagavate Mahamunyu Kite Kimba Purerishwaraha Kimba Purerishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudya Tetra Sadyo Hridi Avarudya Tetra Kriti Bihi Sususa Bistakshanat Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatarur galitam falam. Nigama kalpatarur galitam falam. Sukumukad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukumukad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam malayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam malayam. Mohor aho raskabu vibhavu kaha. Mohor aho raskabu vibhavu kaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam. O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. The mature fruit of the desire to read. It emanated from the lips of she Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectar and juice is already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Including liberated souls. Shinvatam swak 
Sakata Krishna Svatam Sakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidiantak Stohi Abhadrani Vidyanta Stohi Abhadrani Vidu Nati Srihit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is it self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava Kamaloba dayas chaye Chaitar etaira navidam Stitvam sattve prasiddhati By development of devotional service one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance and thus uh, material lust and avarice are diminished. And that's what your lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso. Evam prasana manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangha sichayate. When these impurities are wiped away, when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis, chidyante sarvasam saya, siyante chasyakarmani, drista evatmani swari. Thus, bhakti yoga serves the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness, therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotees in Krishna consciousness, can one understand the science of Krishna. Can one understand the science of Krishna? So we're going to repeat again Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 18, text 22. Yatranurakta sahasaiva dhira Yatranurakta sahasaiva dhira Vyapoya de hadisu sangha udham Vyapoya de hadisu sangha udham Rajan titat Paramaham Syamantyam Rajantitat Paramaham Syamantyam Yasmin Ahim Sopa Sama Swadharmaha Yasmin Ahim Sopa Sama Swadharmaha Translation by Srila Prabhupada Self-controlled persons who are attached to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, can all of a sudden give up the world of material attachment including the gross body and subtle mind, and go away to attain the highest perfection of the renounced order of life, by which nonviolence and renunciation are consequential. <coughs> Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Only the self-controlled can gradually be attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Self-controlled means not indulging in sense enjoyment more than is necessary. And those who are not self-controlled are given over to sense enjoyment. Dry philosophical speculation is a subtle sense enjoyment of the mind. 
Sense enjoyment leads one to the path of darkness. Those who are self-controlled can make progress on the path of liberation from the conditional life of material existence. The Vedas therefore enjoin that one should not go on the path of darkness but should make a progressive march toward the path of light or liberation. That's Tamasima Jatirgama. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Self-control is actually achieved not by artificially stopping the senses from material enjoyment, but by becoming factually attached to the Supreme Lord by engaging one's unalloyed senses in the transcendental service of the Lord. The senses cannot be forcibly curbed, but they can be given proper engagement. Purified senses, therefore, are always engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord. This perfectional stage of sense engagement is called bhakti yoga. So those who are attached to the means of bhakti yoga are factually self-controlled and can all of a sudden give up their homely or bodily attachment for the service of the Lord. This is called Paramahansa stage. Hamsas or swans accept only milk out of a mixture of milk and water. Similarly, those who accept the service of the Lord instead of Maya service are called the Paramahansas. They are naturally qualified with all the good attributes such as pridelessness, freedom from vanity, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, respectability, worship, devotion, and sincerity. All these godly qualities exist in the devotee of the Lord spontaneously. Such Paramahansas who are completely given up to the service of the Lord are very rare. They are very rare even amongst the liberated souls. Real nonviolence means freedom from envy. In this world, everyone is envious of his fellow being. But a perfect Paramahansa, being completely given up to the service of the Lord, is perfectly non-envious. He loves every living being in relation with the Supreme Lord. Real renunciation means perfect dependence on God. Every living being is dependent on someone else because he is so made. Actually, everyone is dependent on the mercy of the Supreme Lord, but when one forgets his relation with the Lord, he becomes dependent on the conditions of material nature. Renunciation means renouncing one's dependence on the conditions. of material nature and thus becoming completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord. Real independence means complete faith in the mercy of the Lord without dependence on the conditions of matter. This Paramahansa stage is the highest perfectional stage in Bhakti Yoga, the process of devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So Prabhupada makes so many wonderful points. I don't want to go over some of them. First of all, we uh, discussed uh, Bhagavad Gita 6, 40, 6 chapter 40th verse, which says, Son of Prita, Arjuna, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction, either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. So in that purport, Prabhupada explains like he is here in this purport about those who are self-controlled and those who are not self-controlled, or those who follow regulative principles and those who are, are non-regulated. So we see the non-regulated, they are always in trouble and they're entangled and they're disturbed 
by so many situations. And they're angry, and they're lusty, and they're greedy, and, and they are envious, and they are uh, in illusion, and they're acting in a deluded state, and they are crazy. So that, that's the position of the non-regulated. They're, they're in deep trouble. And of the regulated, there are three, let's say, categories. Those who are followers of scriptural regulations and who are enjoying material prosperity. And those who are trying to find ultimate liberation from material existence and those who are devotees in Krishna consciousness. So these people are on the auspicious path. However, that first category, the followers of scriptural regulations and rules who are enjoying material prosperity, they can be further divided into two categories or classes. So those who are fruitive workers and those who desire no fruit for sense gratification. So this is explained also in uh, renunciation through wisdom. And Prabhupada gives a little bit more explanation there. He says, human beings are divided into two categories, categories, the law abiders and the law breakers. Those who care only about satisfying their senses and do not submit to discipline and law are like animals, completely uncontrolled, whether such an uncontrolled person is cultured or uncultured. So cultured means they are Naradama. They have knowledge, they have education, but they only use it for sense gratification. <laughs> Although they have so much knowledge and education, they're called Naradamas, the lowest of the low. They're worse than the gross karmis because they have knowledge, but they're using it for sense gratification. So, those who care about those who only uh, ca no those who care only about satisfying their senses and do not submit to discipline and law are like animals, completely uncontrolled. So, like we have some cows, right, and we have some goats. As soon as there's food, they get uncontrolled. They can't control themselves. They're out of control. And then human beings are worse because of lusty desires, they're uncontrolled. They can do anything and they get angry and then they kill someone. They're even worse than the animals. They're on the same level as animals, but even worse because an animal will not attack you if he's not hungry. But a human being can attack you whether he's hungry or not hungry. So they're worse, they're more dangerous when they're uncontrolled. Don't accept discipline and law. Whether such an uncontrolled person is cultured or uncultured, educated or uneducated, weak or strong, his actions are always bestial. They can never benefit anyone. Well, this is interesting, you know, uh, because every day, you see examples of this in newspapers and the news of bestial people who are educated, who drive cars, who dress nicely, who talk, who can talk uh, coherently, but yet they're bestial, low class, really scum of the earth. The law abiding human beings are further divided into three groups of three groups. One, the karmis, or fruit of workers, the jnanis, or, uh, or the jnanis, or knowledge seekers, and the bhaktas, or devotees. The karmis, or the karma, or the karmis are divided into two sections, the sakama karmi, or the fruit of workers, who want to enjoy the results of their labor, and the niskama karmi, Karmis who renounce the fruits of action. The Sakama 
karmis are greedy after insignificant transient happiness. They make progress in their mundane activities and enjoy the heavenly planets in the life hereafter. But all of that enjoyment is temporary. Therefore, the soul's real benefit evades them. So these are the people who are engaged in uh, regulated activities, according to the Vedas, but who are attached to the results for sense gratification. And then those are the Sakama karmis. And then the Nishkama karmis, they're engaged in Vedic sacrificial performances, just like the Sakama karmis. But they offer the results to Krishna. So they are on the on a progressive path of Krishna consciousness, and the Sakama karmis are not. Although it looks like they're doing the same thing. But one has attachment to the result and the other is offering the result to Krishna. So the karmis are divided into two sections, the sakama karmis, or fruit of workers who want to enjoy the results of their labor, and the niskama karmis, who renounce the fruits of action. The sakama karmis are greedy after insignificant transient happiness. So they they want this immediate pleasure. There's uh, Shreya and Preya. So, uh, Shreya is long-term uh, uh, goal of life and Preya is short-term goal, goal of life. So these Sakama Karnis, they're looking for the fast food instant sense gratification. <laughs> so the they make progress in their mundane activities. Yeah, their business does better, their health is okay, and after they die, they go to the heavenly planets. And But all that enjoyment is temporary. Therefore, the soul's real benefit evades them. In other words, the real purpose of the soul is not accomplished by such people. Therefore, the soul's real benefit evades them. To attain true eternal happiness, which comes only after the dis dissipation of material bondage, in other words, getting rid of material bondage, <clears throat> is the real benefit for the soul. Thus, any path that does not lead the soul to strive for the supreme goal, eternal transcendental bliss, is considered useless. When eternal bliss is the goal of ritualistic activities, karma kanda, then they are transformed into karma yoga. <clears throat> Through the practice of karma yoga, the heart is purified of material contamination and one gains knowledge of the absolute. Thereafter, one becomes situated in meditation on the absolute and finally one attains bhakti, pure devotional service. In the process of karma kanda, it is recommended, karmakanda is material attachment to the result. They're performing Vedic rituals, but they're attached to the result, and the result is for sense gratification. <clears throat> so through the practice of karma yoga, the heart is purified of material contamination, and one gains knowledge of the absolute. Thereafter, one becomes situated in meditation on the absolute, and finally one attains bhakti, pure devotional service. In the process of karma kanda, it is recommended that one renounce physical pleasures for a time. So a karmi may sometimes be called an ascetic, meaning a, a renounced yogi. Yet, however, yet, however much penance a karmi may perform, ultimately this penance is another form of sensual enjoyment since that is its ultimate goal. So that's, that was Hiranyakashipu. He did a terrible sacrifice or penance, denying himself sense gratification for at least a hundred years, standing on his toes with his arms stretched out straight up. And he stayed like that and an anthill perform, uh, formed around his body and the ants ate all his flesh, blood, tendons, ligaments, everything. There was only bones, but he still stayed alive because he was a mystic yogi. And finally, uh, Lord Shiva came to him and said, what do you want? What is this? What are you doing? 
And he said, uh, I, uh, well, I think it was Lord Brahma that came, I'm sorry. And, and he said, what do you want? You know, he said, I, I want to be Amara, meaning no death. He said, I can't give you that. I'm not Amara myself. Then he, he was very clever, so he asked him to uh, give him benedictions, like no, no uh, deva or asura can kill him. Of course, he forgot to mention human beings, because you know he was uh, he was uh, killing human beings easily, right? So he, he could never imagine a human being could kill him. And then he said, and it shouldn't be during the day or during the night. Okay, but it happened at dusk, in between day and night. And it shouldn't be on land or on water or in the air. Okay, it happened on the lap of the Shringa day, right? And like this, he gave all these different, uh, it couldn't be by any weapon. Okay, it was, he was torn apart by the nails of the Shringa day. So, he, taught, he thought he was Amara after getting all these benedictions, but actually, he was not Amara. And then this most amazing creature appeared, half lion, half man, not a Shingadev, and he tore him apart. Uh, so he never imagined that there was such a being like that. So Krishna took that very special incarnation to destroy Hiranya, Kashipu. So he was an example of someone who did tremendous physical austerity, but it was for naught, it was for nothing, because he was killed anyway by Krishna himself in that in this ma magnificent form of Nishingadev. So, yet however much penance a karmi may perform, ultimately this penance is another form of sensual enjoyment since that is its ultimate goal. Ah, that's the point. That if our ultimate goal is Krishna and we sincerely work for that goal, then we're on the progressive path. But if our ultimate goal is sense gratification, but we do everything that looks like it's, like it's on the right path, like uh, austerity and penances and chanting mantras, and doing pujas and things like that. But yet, it's not. Everything depends on the motive. Prabhupada has explained this. Everything depends on the motive. What is the motive? If the person's motive is sense gratification, then uh, he's not going to achieve his goal, even if he does things that look right. And uh, Prabhupada explains in his first chapter, 28th verse, where he says, Yes, yat, mabudi kunape, chidak. Uh, no. It's, no, and I says, Yes, yas, ti bhakti bhagavat yakin chena, sarvar gunas tatra samasate sura, harava bhakta se kuto mahad guna, mano ratinasati dahavato bhai. So this is a very important verse. Ten, this is the uh, fifth chapter of. Shrimad Bhagavatam, I'm not, 5th Canto, 18th chapter, verse number 12. And he says, One who has unflinching devotion for the personality of Godhead has all the good qualities of the demigods. But one who is not a devotee of the Lord has only material qualifications that are of little value. This is because he's hovering on the mental plane and is certain to be attracted by the glaring material energy. Now, this is also explained in uh, the Renunciation Through Wisdom, where it says, there's an alternate translation of this verse. And it says, hmm. a person devoid of devotional service and engaged in material activities has no good qualities. Even if he is adept at the practice of mystic yoga, like Hiranyakashipu, or the honest endeavor of maintaining his family and relatives, he must be driven by his own material speculations and must engage in the service 
of the Lord's external energy, meaning Maya, how can there be any good qualities in such a man? Whoa, what a alternate translation. <laughs> He's explaining much more what is meant by this verse. So it says that because a person's mind is hovering on a mental platform, what's the mental platform? The platform of wanting sustainable sense gratification. So this is the, more like the mode of goodness, material goodness. So they want sustainable sense gratification. And he learned that by doing pujas and satyanarayana pujas and doing uh, sudarshan puja and this thing, that puja, this puja, that puja, shani puja, whatever, that uh, he can have much more sustainable sense gratification. But the whole thing is for nothing because it, it, it's, it's useless labor. It's, uh, uh, yeah, useless labor. Or as it says, shrama eva hi kevalam. It's, it's uh, useless. Why? Because it's going to come to an end because it's for sense gratification. Even though he's getting heavenly sense gratification for a long time, it still comes to an end. So then Prabhupada says the only way to cure this mental disease, what's the mental disease? The mind is hovering on the mental platform of sense gratification. It's a disease. Just like COVID is a disease. And this mentally focused on sense gratification is a disease. It's not the natural state of the mind. So the only way to cure this mental disease is to wholeheartedly follow Lord Chaitanya's instruction to chant the holy names of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This will cleanse the heart of all impurities until this esoteric truth, esoteric means like it's mysterious, right? It sounds too easy. You just chant Hare Krishna and all your problems go away. People say, wait a minute, that's too easy. Give me something harder. <laughs> they, but they can't do what's easy. They can't chant the 16 rounds every day. Uh, good rounds. They're always chanting, you know, they hand in the bead bag, like, you know, 8 o'clock at night, you know, and walking around. What's happening there? Yeah, okay. And, uh, oh, yeah, this is nice to cure. And, uh, oh, you want me to, to, to cut some vegetables? Oh, okay, honey. That's not chanting Hare Krishna. You're not meditating on the holy name by walking around with your hand in the bead bag. Uh, you know, oftentimes I see people on a Sunday feast, you know, they're, they're, they're leaning against the door there and, and have the hand in the bead bag and going like this. You know, I mean, how can you concentrate like that? It's, that's not chanting. That's inattentive chanting. It's one of the offenses against the holy name. So one has to be serious about chanting. Uh, so people say, oh, that's too easy. Uh, give me something hard. Let me, uh, let me uh, l l let's do some Kriya Yoga. <laughs> you can't do Kriya Yoga. It's impossible to do it uh, and succeed in this age. You know, it's very dangerous also. So if it's so easy, then why don't you do it? You know, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in English, take the, the route of least resistance. Take the road of least resistance or take the path of least resistance, right? Why, why should you take the path of most resistance? Like for example, in uh, World War II, you see, in Vedic times, wars did not last a long time. It's not like, you know, the Afghan war has been going on for like, you know, 28 years. This is ridiculous. How long did the Battle of Kurukshetra last? 18 days. Why? Because in the Vedic times, kings had to be fighting with the soldiers. And if the king died, the war was, war was over. So in that way, that's why they were trying to kill Yudhisthira. They couldn't kill him. Uh, and uh, or kill Arjuna, but they, they were not able to kill him. But, but all the others, Duryodhan was killed. 
the, the, they lost the whole war. And it only lasted 18 days. This nonsense of, you know, war is going on for years, like World War II went on for about six years, and World War I went on for about five, six years. You know, it's crazy. So many people dying, and then innocent people being killed, right? People who are not soldiers. Or they threw an atomic bomb on, on Japan. They killed 100,000 people at once. And, and, and they, they threw two atomic bombs on Japan, and they, kill, and, and they killed so many people. You know, those people, most of those people were not warriors. They were just common people, and they, they, they got wiped out, right? So all this is sinful. It's, it's, it's horrible. And nowadays, you know, so many wars are taking place, and people are displaced. In World War II, there was like, you know, I think it was like 50 million people were displaced. That means they had to leave their homes. They lost their homes. And they just had to walk away, and they didn't know where they were going to go and what was going to happen to them. So we see that uh, here in this alternate uh, definition, it says, they want to be, uh, one often comes across monas and pseudo devotees posing as Lord Krishna's devotees. These are Mayavadis, and these are the sense gratifiers who pretend to be. Krishna devotees. But eventually they try to usurp Krishna's position. They want to be Lord Krishna themselves. If a fruitive worker thinks that Lord Krishna is an ordinary mortal, he does not attain the goal of his fruitive work, elevation to the heavenly planets. And if an anthropomorphist happens to be a jnani, an empirical philosopher, then he also fails to achieve the goal of his pursuit of knowledge, liberation from the material modes. So one that cannot have a material motive and pursue Krishna consciousness, they will fall down. Okay, so this is a nice verse. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 5, 18, 12, Prabhupada often quotes it. Okay, so therefore we'll come back and I'll finish. Um, So, this same subject is explained in depth. That is, what is it? The category of a person who's performing Vedic yagyas, who seems to be following the path of Krishna consciousness, but actually is not. Because their goal is sense gratification. <clears throat> so what happened? Uh, it says at present we are living in the thick of Kali Yuga the people of this age are mostly short lived misguided, unfortunate and always tormented by disease and distress therefore it is not easy for them to appreciate the words of the scriptures the followers of the world's various religions Hindu, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists and so on are transgressing the scriptural injunctions of their own faiths in varying ways or varying degrees and living as they like. That's the point. Living as they like. They go to church or they come to the temple, they chant, they sing, and so forth, and they make confessions and, and get blessings and everything. And then they go home and just continue normal sense gratification. So, and he's saying the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, the Buddhists, and so on, are transgressing the scriptural injunctions of their own faiths to varying degrees and living as they like. Many people, far from following scriptural injunctions, ridicule the sacred texts and thus gradually slide down to a demoniac life of unrestricted sense enjoyment. So this, these are the hardcore karmis, right? They might have been born in a good family, that took them to church or the synagogue or the mosque, but then something happened. God forbid, they went to school. They went to these public schools where they're indoctrinated with uh, materialism, and then they became first-class sense gratifiers after that. <clears throat> 
Many people, far from following scriptural injunctions, ridicule the sacred texts and thus gradually slide down to a demoniac life of unrestricted sense enjoyment. At one time, there was a mother that brought her son who had just graduated high school to the temple. And there was one devotee here, uh, that devotee is not here anymore, uh, who was like really, you know, gung ho about uh, uh, Krishna consciousness. So uh, that gung ho devotee is walking into the temple downstairs, right? And this mother and her son were walking out of the temple. And she stopped them and started preaching to them, you know, talking about this thing, that thing, you know and all Krishna, all Krishna conscious things, you know. And the boy was impatient, you know, and he said, and she said, you know, I think she said, you know, now you should chant the name of God, you know. And he said, I'm not interested in the name of God. And mother was shocked, right, because he just graduated high school. Now, up until the time when he was about 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, he was chanting mantras, he was learning, uh, he was going to, uh, uh, ch chanting uh, the uh, Purusha Shukta, chanting the uh, uh, you know the hundred and eight, uh, thousand and eight names of uh, Lord Vishnu, Sahasra, uh, and so and and like he was he was good, you know. But then, by the time he he went to middle school, then high school, then he graduated, he said, "I'm not interested in this." And the and the gung-ho devotee got really angry and scolded him and the mother was horrified by the whole thing and then the boy said now I'm convinced I'm not interested in this and walked out is it so <laughs> sometimes in the eagerness and let's say fanaticism to preach to someone instead of preaching to them you fry them just like if you fry mustard seeds and then you plant them, they don't grow. <laughs> because they're fried, they've been killed, right? So in the same way, if you over-preach to someone, you can kill them. Just like if you overdose someone, you can kill them, right? If you overdose them with an anesthetic uh, or a, uh, uh, some drug, you can kill them. And the same way with preaching sometimes. If you're not aware of who you're preaching to, you just, you know, one shoe fits all. Okay, so Prabhupada says, many people far from following scriptural injunctions ridicule the sacred text and thus gradually slide down to a demoniac life of unrestricted sense enjoyment. The Supreme Lord and his devotees are very much concerned about the deliverance of these conditioned souls affiliated by the ill influence of Kali Yuga. Now, devotees are very concerned about these people who are suffering today due to ignorance the devotees, or Vaishnavas, are the most compassionate, saintly souls, and thus they ardently desire to deliver the fallen living entities. The Supreme Lord always responds to the desires of his Vaishnavas, and so he answers their prayers for the salvation of these suffering souls of Kali Yuga. But look how eloquent Prabhupada is writing. This is amazing. Seeing the miserable condition of the living entities in, Kali, in the Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya, the savior of the fallen souls, has expounded a method for their salvation. This method is taken from the scriptures and is applicable to everyone. In previous ages, one could study the Vedas and purify oneself by living according to those instructions. But it is impossible for the present population to properly execute these Vedic injunctions which include strictly following vows of celibacy. He says it's impossible today. One who is extremely degraded and sinful cannot find the accurate path to realization by studying the Vedas. You can study the Vedas, you're not going to succeed. It is a waste of time even to explain the meaning of the Vedas to such persons who are devoid of a proper upbringing and discipline. Amen, that's a fact. That is a fact so hard to convince these people that have been not grown up in good families, not educated properly, and they're just so low class. But we still try, like giving them prasadam, being nice to them, giving them books and so forth, and preaching to them. Lord Chaitanya has indeed showered his mercy upon these Kali Yuga people. 
So there is no doubt that those who are unable even to receive this mercy from Lord Chaitanya are forever bereft of saving grace. As for those fortunate souls who, after realizing the greatness of Lord Chaitanya's mercy, have accepted it, what is his mercy? It's the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, right? And Prashadam. They have escaped the punishments of Maya or the dispensation of providence. So this big term, dispensation of providence, means the punishment of Maya. <clears throat> For those who have agreed to come under the influence of the cycle of karmic reactions and are being pummeled about by Maya, the Supreme Lord has arranged the process of karma yoga or fruit of activities with the aim of sacrifice to the Supreme Lord. So we'll stop right there. That is, this karma yoga, you can get your material desires to a certain degree, but by performing sacrifices. But if you are unlucky enough to have a, bo a bogus uh, Brahmin who wants to keep you doing these sacrifices because he makes money out of it and doesn't explain that this is not the real goal, then you are being cursed by a guy with a thread and who says mantras, right? You have to meet a genuine brahmana or a genuine devotee. First of all, you'll get your material desires satisfied to a certain degree, but then gradually you'll understand in the association of such persons that this is not the real goal. There's a much higher and wonderful goal, and that's Krishna consciousness. Okay, we'll stop right here. This is <clears throat> covering some of the points of this purport that we read today. Any questions? The karmis category two, the nishkama karmis. No, sakama. Okay, go ahead. There's two. There's no, the nishkama and category, sakama. The second category. I mean, I the, understood. Okay, the, the uh, second category, yeah, nishkama. Like like, for example, Hiranyakashipu is a Sakama yes. uh, karmi, and yeah. then uh, we're talking about the Nishkama karmi, who eventually... Nishkama karmi becomes, a, uh, eventually, a karma yogi. Karma yogi. Yeah, actually performing karma yogi. Yeah, because uh, after yeah. the results are... But uh, before, they were doing karma kanda, hmm. materially motivated uh, karmic actions. Correct that are based on Vedas. So just to make sure that the distinction between a Krishna conscious person who's working versus a Sakama Karma Yogi, is the Sakama Karma Yogi, sorry, Nishkama Karma Yogi versus Krishna conscious person? The, this, uh, the Nishkama Yogi is is enjoying material opulences, right? But, I but he's, he's offering the results to Krishna, hmm. right? Like for example, we are, uh, let's say, uh, someone is doing very well in, in their business, but they're a devotee and they come to the temple and they offer the result of their work to the, to the Lord. So that's a Nishkama Yogi, right? Uh, or, yeah, Nishkama Karmi. <laughs> it's called a Nishkama Karmi, right? Mm. But when he offers everything to the Lord, he becomes a, he's mm. performing nice karma now. Mm. Nice karma. That, that is, everything is for the Lord. Mm. The Nishkama Karmi is offering the results to the Lord, but he's enjoying the results so just like also. Some partial. Yes. Is, is only giving some yes. partial. Yes. Okay. But when it's 100 percent, then it's nice karma, devotee, mm. everything for the Lord. Okay. Now, is there something wrong with being a niskama uh, karmi? No. They're following rules and regulations. They're offering, uh, you know, certain amount of results to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that because it's a progressive path. But the other one, the Sakama uh, Karmi, is that is, there's no progression there. Mm. They end up in a dead end of enjoying and suffering, enjoying and suffering. 
Okay? Correct. Krishna consciousness is progressive. That's why, that's why Prabhupada is making this distinction. I mean, have you ever, ever heard this before? Anyone ever explained this to you before? No. no. no they don't explain it. The, the brahmanas out there, they don't understand these things. You know, they're, 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 they're sakama karmis. <laughs> Leading people into a dead end. And, and this is related to, uh, I think, what we you, you talked about a, a day or two ago, wherein like, the brahmanas think that based on the birth, you have to suffer through. There is no progression. Yes. Progressive yeah, you progress. can't change your karma. Correct. All nonsense, all nonsense stuff. All demoniac stuff. It's actually demoniac because you're denying a person progression in spiritual life. You're denying them. You say it's not possible. And it's demoniac. You know, the, the, the uh, definition of violence, let's look at that. It's very interesting. Let me see where that is. In the 16th chapter, I think it's there. No, no, okay. Well, this is the 13th chapter. Uh, Prabhupada explains what is actual violence. Usually we think violence, you know, you hurt someone, you know, you, you hit them on the head with a sledgehammer, right? But Prabhupada explains that uh, humility, pride, this is nonviolence. Let's see what he says here. Nonviolence is generally taken to mean not killing or destroying the body. But actually, Nonviolence means not to put others into distress. People in general are trapped by ignorance in the material concept of life, and they perpetually suffer material pains. So unless one elevates people to spiritual knowledge, one is practicing violence. One should try his best to distribute real knowledge to the people so that they may become enlightened and leave this material entanglement. That is nonviolence. So if you deny a person to go on a progressive path, a spiritual life, you're being violent. Yeah. So that I just read from the 13th chapter, 8th to 12th verse in the purport. Any other questions, comments? Come here, come here, come here. Now this nis is nis kama karmi, and there's nice karmya, devotee. Nice karmya means everything for Krishna. Nis kama karmi means he's offering things to Krishna. He's in, at the same time, he's enjoying uh, material opulence. So, is this also is this also a progressive part? No, that is the progressive part because when he understands that everything should be given to Krishna, at that point he becomes nice karma yogi. He becomes a real uh, devotee. I mean, it's not that the niskama karmi is not. A devotee. He's, he's on a devotional path, right? He's regulated. He's following Vedic rules and regulations, right? But there's still some, you know, uh, desire for enjoying. But when he offers everything to Krishna, then he becomes niskarmya, nice karmya, nice karmya. It's not N I C E, but N A I S karmya. He becomes complete, completely surrendered to the Lord. So, you, you mean to say that his karma is, otherwise he's practicing karma mishra bhakti? Is that correct? Uh, maybe. Maybe. Well, we'd have to read some more to, to, to say. I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to look it sound more like, carefully. It sounds like one with a karma, a, a karma mishra bhakti, it sounds the same like his karma. Okay, so here it says the karmis are divided into two sections. It okay. says karmis, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. The sakama karmis, mm -hmm. or fruitive workers who want to enjoy the results of their work, labor, right. and the niskama karmis who renounce the fruits of action. 
The Sakama Karmis are greedy after insignificant transient happiness. They make progress in their mundane activities and enjoy the heavenly planets in the life hereafter. But all their enjoyment is temporary, therefore the soul's real benefit evades them. Okay, now that, that covered that's the Sakama. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. So now that's out of the way. Now we're talking only about Niskama okay. Karmi. So it's always Niskama Karmi, right? So then it says, to attain true eternal happiness, which comes only after the dis, uh, dis, uh, dissipation of material bondage, is the real benefit for the soul. Thus, any path that does not lead the soul to strive for this supreme goal, eternal transcendental bliss, is considered useless. When eternal bliss is the goal of ritualistic activities, karma kanda, then they are transformed into karma yoga. Through the practice of karma yoga, the heart is purified of material contamination and one gains knowledge of the absolute. Thereafter, one becomes situated in meditation on the absolute and finally one attains bhakti, pure devotional service. In the process of karma kanda, it is recommended that one renounce physical pleasures for a time. So the karmi may sometimes be called an ascetic. Yet, however, much penance Yet, however much penance a karmi, a karmi may perform, ultimately this penance is another form of sensual enjoyment, since that is, okay, so that, all right, we didn't get to nice, nice karmi. One second, I'll tell you, I have to see where that is. It's later on in this book. What we heard was how one goes from being a karma kandi to a karma yogi. But uh, we didn't exactly answer the question, so let's, one second. I think we'll find that in Bhagavad Gita, if we read third chapter. Yeah, it should be in the Bhagavad Gita also. Third chapter, yeah, because there's a Karma Mishra, because the two type of devotees, Karma Mishra, Jnana Mishra, and, and, and uh, pure devotee. So if a pure devotee is nice karma, yeah? so niskarma bhakta is a karma mystery. Oh, karma mystery, because that word is there, karma mystery bhakta, mixed. Yes. Okay, so Srimad Bhagavatam, one, two, seven. One, two, seven. Let's take a look at that. Also, it'll be interesting to find the, the meaning of karma mishra also. Then, uh, we find that in the index, karma mishra. Okay, 127 says, uh, by rendering devotion service on 30% of God at Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Okay, so in that purport, he's going to explain nice karma. And another, uh, sorry, Maharaj, I don't, I don't want to. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. To, uh, 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 Chaitanya Chaitanya said, Bukti Mukti Siddhi Kami. Sakaliya Santa. Santa. Nis, Krishna Bhakta Niskam. Ateva. Uh, Ateva Santa. Yeah. So Krishna Bhakta Niskam. So Niskam. May, it could be ni nice karmia and Niskam. Nisram said Krishna Bhakta. So that's the ultimate. So that's completely different between Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami. Yeah, I think even in the Marastro chapter, the relation of uh, what the Lord says, uh, what completely uh, is centered around your activities and the means of uh, Yes, that's, that's nice karma. Engage in devotional service yeah. because sometimes those words can be uh, oh, um, come on nice karma and nice karma mm -hmm. could also mean the same thing. No, Chaitanya Bhagavad Gita said that Krishna Bhakta nice karma. Huh? 
So nice, nice karma means not undertaking activities that will produce good or bad effects. So that's a, a karma. Yeah, transcendental. Transcendental activity, right? So, 362, what does that say? Oh yeah, okay. All right, so this is Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, 47th verse, right at the end of the purport it says, Service to the Lord, which is free from desire for material profit, either in this life or in the next. Devoid of such inclinations, one should fully absorb the mind in the Supreme. That is the purpose of nice karma, mm. Gopala Tapani Upanishad. So that is like the highest level where one has no other thought. So, so there is a difference between the niskama karmi and the nice karma devotee. The niskama karmi is interested still in, in enjoying the benefits of uh, bias activity or spiritual activity. Uh, but they're offering uh, either part of it or most of it of the results of their work to the Lord. But they're still involved in uh, profit calculation, mm. right? Mm. Even though they're giving to the Lord, the nice karma has no profit calculation at all. It says, it says here, which is free from desire for material profit. That's the point. Free from the desire for material profit, either in this life or in the next. That's nice karma? Ni nice, nice karma. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Nice karma, in this karma, Karmi. It's, it, karmi means they're still somewhat affected by the material modes, right? Mm. Although they're engaged in. No, no, they're not that bad. <laughs> they're not that bad. But now, you know. <laughs> those, those are the hardcore karmis that say that. Yeah, no, they, they, these are good people. These are good. They're on the progressive path, right? But now, now Chaitanya Jamta is the postgraduate. He says this. That verse you just said, I think. I no, that verse you quoted is the correct verse. Bhukti right. Mukti Siddhikami, Sakaliya okay. Santa. And then you know. Krishna Bhakta Krishna Bhakta Niskam. Yeah. I wish we could, um, could have the purport in that verse, I don't know. Because, because Chaitanya Chaitanya is the highest. We said Krishna Bhakta, then Niskam. I don't know, probably. You know, sometimes... This, this, this it depends how you spell it. If it's N-A-I-S, it's nice karma. If it's uh, N-A-I, because understand or N-I-S, N-I-S, it's nice karma. The, the it's, pronunciation it's, it's nice karma is huh? different. This, so sometimes Sanskrit, in the Bengali, could mean the same word in Sanskrit, a little different like not because bef different between nice karma and nice calm yeah it could be the same but because of bengali they don't pronounce no nice but calm. you have to look at what he's talking about nice karma karmi mm. okay with okay. the word karmi the sakama karmi and nice karma karmi so then my clarify it Right. Then try to act giving up all your results of work and try to be something. Ah. So that there is a difference between... This comes in a category of karma mishra bhakti. Yeah, so one is that uh, where you're, you're giving up the results. So in, in ideally, akarma means like you're completely in the consciousness of the Lord and mm. you're doing only for the pleasure of the Lord. Yeah. No, but look, look what it says here. It says that that is also recommended here because by the practice of giving up the fruits of one's activity, one is sure to purify his mind gradually. And in that purified stage of mind, one becomes able to understand Krishna consciousness. So, you know, the, the, yeah, there, there, there are different steps toward nice karma where everything is for Krishna. That's the highest yes. And this karma, 
Carmi is on that path, but hasn't reached that highest pinnacle yet. Okay, let's just understand it like that. You know, otherwise you get too many details, you get confused. Yeah. Yes, and the whole point is uh, service to the Lord, which is free from desire for material profit, either in this life or in the next. That is nice karma. No, no hint of any material uh, gain. That's that's you know a karma is pure devotional service. Okay, we'll stop right there. Hari Bhagavad Prabhupada Ki Jai. You see how Prabhupada is going into big detail. <laughs>